So here's a question. Why do people like this keep showing up at women's rights rallies? Several men belonging to the neo-Nazi group were seen dressed in black and performing a Nazi salute. Anyone who doesn't hug left-wing ideology is classed as a neo-Nazi by lefties. Extreme views on both sides. The most violent mobs are the woke ones. All you have to do is say something true, like there are only two genders, and they attack in a mob. And... How stupid do they think we are? (laughs) The past few years have seen the radical right collaborating with radical feminists on a totally unprecedented scale, to the point that, in certain cases, the two movements are totally impossible to tell apart. This is not a new observation, lots of people have made it, but it's on my mind a lot lately, because uh, it's at my house now. Obviously, uh, female sports, female change rooms, female bathrooms should be for females not for biological males. The leader of Canada's Conservative Party keeps saying these things TERFs have been saying for years. This guy's probably going to be our next prime minister. And to make matters worse, the Conservative Premier of my province recently convened a panel to shape policy on gender identity in schools, whatever that means. None of the panelists are trans, and the leader is associated with a gender-critical feminist group. This dude is, for the record, like the epitome of the racist uncle. There is no world in which this collaboration makes sense. But when people naturally get curious about this and ask why gender criticals are so similar to conservatives these days, they're often met with thought terminating responses like, well, they were always conservative. And that's not entirely wrong, but there's gotta be some sense of scale here. There's actually a world of difference between the prejudiced left-wing TERFs of 1980 and the eager Nazi collaborators of 2024. Fascist is the new word for legend. Arguing that trans-exclusionary feminism was always conservative obscures just how far right the movement has drifted in recent years. To the point that now, the people in charge barely identify as feminists at all. Today's anti-trans movement is led by a united front of women's activists, social conservatives, and straight-up neo-Nazis. And importantly, which one a person calls themselves in public doesn't reliably tell you which one they are. We've got prominent feminists saying parents who take their kids to drag shows should serve prison time. We've got prominent feminists befriending, praising, and working with anti-abortion homophobes. We've got white nationalist websites praising TERFs and feminist websites lifting their tactics from the Daily Stormer. Editing Lily here, I don't want to bombard you with examples or anything, but there has been a development. Um, March 13th, JK Rowling is doing Holocaust denial now. She got on Twitter and she denied the burning of Magnus Hirschfeld's sexual health archives, which was a key moment in the intensification of Nazi power. It was uh, probably one of the best known Nazi book burnings. And uh, she thinks she thinks it's ridiculous. Now that she's been called out on this wild take, she is also retweeting things, mocking the idea that trans people were killed in camps which is a documented, objective fact. By the time this video comes out, there's a decent chance someone at Warner Brothers or whatever has made her apologize for this and she's walked it back. Um, But as it stands now, I'm pretty speechless. Um, Even after making this long video about how wealthy liberals like her could get drawn into right-wing extremism, I never thought we would see something so brazen from her. A lot of people have acknowledged that the right is working with feminists and expressed concern. But I haven't heard anyone talk in depth about why it's happening or how this is impacting the political opinions on either side. So basically, how did we get here? Why did feminists, conservatives, and fascists decide to form a coalition? Why on trans issues specifically? And above all, how is this actually going for them? I hope you're ready, folks, because just like visitors to a surrealist exhibit, the time has come to get in the pipeline. So anti-trans feminism originated in the 1970s among radical feminists like Mary Daly and Janice Raymond, author of the famous book The Transsexual Empire. I'm not going to give an exhaustive history here because lots of people have done that already, but the important thing to understand is that radical feminists were a pretty coherent and focused movement at the time. They were all united by being strongly anti-gender and opposing anything they thought naturalized the connection between biology and destiny. Anti-gender doesn't mean anti-trans, or even really imply it. 
I mean, I think trans people are real. Yeah, pretty sure. And I also think traditional ideas about gender exist to keep women down. These things play fine together. As a result, radical feminists were split on how to think about trans people, but not that split. A minority, including Janice Raymond, thought that people transitioning to female represented gender entrenching itself. But most radical feminists thought trans experience could teach us a lot about how gender functions in society. Raymond's depiction of trans people is neither the first nor the exclusive feminist account of trans issues. Indeed, Susan Kessler and Wendy McKenna's Gender, an ethno-methodological approach, was published a year earlier. This work extensively discussed transsexualism, not in terms of transsexualism as misogyny like Raymond, but as an example of how we are all doing or performing gender. Kessler and McKenna were curious about what trans perspectives might have to contribute to the understanding of gender experience, gender relations, or women's oppression. In the early days, these two sects butted heads, but also attended the same events, quoted the same books, and considered themselves to be fighting for the same goals, only through contradicting strategies. The transsexual empire objects to trans women out of a suspicion that we are men, dysfunctionally trying to hold on to power over women in an era of rising feminism. And therefore, the book understands trans healthcare and social inclusion as institutional sexism. This is not really supported by any of her contemporaries' ideas about gender, and it's not hard to see how it would drift away from feminism toward the movement we know today. Whether or not it means to, it ends up affirming biology as destiny and arguing in favor of gender policing to keep women safe. But Janice Raymond did not invent transphobia, even among feminists. She won over new members by appealing to a prejudice they already carried, which naturally attracted people who were less attached to advancing the feminist cause and more into building a framework around their bigotry. Early anti-trans feminism was also prone to reading hidden motives into trans existence, which lent itself really well to conspiracy theory. It was all about the medical industry normalizing transsexuality for profit, creating these uncanny post-gender post-humans. While Janice Raymond has insisted the transsexual empire wasn't about an intentional plot to invade women's spaces, it's very easy to read it that way, and a lot of people did. So I can see why people call this sort of thing conservative or fascist. You know, they wanted me to stop existing. They were quite bad. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, the right doesn't have a copyright on bigotry, and I find radical feminists hard to pin down as simply left or right. I often see them taking positions I find horrible for reasons I pretty much agree with. Turfs like Janice Raymond and Mary Daly weren't calling for a return to some simpler time before trans people existed. They were, you know, radicals who wanted to totally reshape gender or get rid of it altogether. The prevention of transsexual surgery and the social conditions that generate it are not achieved by legislation forbidding surgery. Rather, it is more important to regulate, by legal measures, the sexist social conditions that generate transsexual surgery, and also, legally, to limit the medical institutional complex that translates these sexist conditions into the realm of transsexualism. The conservative establishment in the 70s didn't know any of this was going on. But if they had, they wouldn't have liked it. Above all, radical feminism was an attack on masculinity, on family values. Their vision for the future sucked and would have made sexism worse if it ever came to pass, but they didn't formally veer right until decades later. Enter Wolf. Not the non-binary person who, whatever, I don't care about this joke, is an acronym. Wolf, or Women's Liberation Foundation, was founded by Lierre Keith in 2013 after her previous organization, Deep Green Resistance, came under fire for extreme and repeated transphobia. Deep Green Resistance is a radical environmentalist group I honestly can't get a handle on. Some people have called it eco-fascist, but I can't find solid proof of that. There's a whole video to make just about these guys, and I hope someone does make it. But for our purposes today, what matters is... Lear Keith is transphobic, alienates the entire environmentalist movement, and starts Wolf. Wolf is a single issue organization. You'll never guess which issue. And while it does try to recruit existing gender critical feminists, following the 2016 US election, it prioritizes making friends on the radical right. They're steering the ship and they agree with Wolf that trans people are bad. So I guess Keith figures anything to advance the cause. 
Over the rest of the decade, Wolf would make such galaxy-brained moves as accepting $15,000 from Alliance Defending Freedom, an influential Christian nationalist law firm that would like to criminalize sodomy in the U.S., filing a joint lawsuit with the Family Policy Alliance, a Christian nationalist organization, in hopes of preventing the U.S. government from expanding discrimination protections to trans people, going on Fox News a whole bunch, and participating in at least two anti-trans panels at the Heritage Foundation, the right-wing organization to whom Americans owe the worst parts of the Reagan presidency. And yes, obviously all of these groups hate abortion. Wolf and their right-wing collaborators actually wore this blatant hypocrisy as a mark of honor, using it to say, you know, we wouldn't be doing this unless we really needed to. It got people talking, it raised their profile, and other anti-trans feminists took note. So that's the tactics angle covered, but if you're curious how someone could justify to themselves going from speaking at anarchist book fairs to working with anti-gay, anti-abortionists, me too. <laughs> Lyra Keith is honestly a fascinating character because unlike what you'd expect, she's not some soulless mouthpiece. She has these very specific esoteric beliefs and I suspect she's willing to join any movement that'll let her voice them. Sometimes that means being a radical feminist. Sometimes that means going on a dozen carnivore diet podcasts to denounce veganism you know, for the planet. <laughs> this collaboration is always talked about like it's one between two totally opposite tendencies who share this one thing in common. I think it's fair to be skeptical of that. Broadly speaking, do people like Lear Keith actually agree with these right-wing foundations who keep giving them resources? Uh, maybe that's a questionable answer 7,500 words from now. See you in 44 minutes. These choices have since been adopted across the entire movement pretty much without exception which I think is a pretty big stumbling block for a lot of onlookers. You know, how can they claim to be fighting for women if they're taking money from anti-abortionists? How can J.K. Rowling call herself a feminist while earning praise from Vladimir Putin? This, by the way, not a statement on Russia. Please do not read this quilt as a statement on Russia. We have to remember that every single ideology has ideas about what's best for women, and they almost universally advocate in favor of those ideas. Even the people who think women are only good for babies and housework typically make the appeal that this arrangement would make women happier too. Women being roughly half the population, to do anything else would be political suicide. Yo, it's Lynn, and I have to laugh. How can we need not be equal? We're like half. Like women are like half of the people on earth. You can argue that just about any policy is better for women, and making that case does not inherently make a policy feminist. There's a long and global history of using protecting women as a Trojan horse for sexist, racist, or otherwise oppressive policies, and boy will we get into those. So when you're advocating on behalf of women, your potential base is much bigger than just existing feminists. It's the entire world. Now, trans exclusion was never popular with feminists, but this increased collaboration with the right was really unpopular, even among existing TERFs. Here's a quote from Kai Shevers, who was herself a TERF when all this went down. Don't worry, she's better now. I was hanging out with these transphobic radical feminists when the right wing creep happened. I know that there's a whole lot of them that actually feel completely fucked over. At this point, Wolf and those following its lead were alienating more and more principled feminists by the day, but their collaboration wasn't strictly necessary. Anyone could stand in for them. And the right had a lot more money, so that kind of settled it. Especially since 2017, gender critical feminists have all but abandoned efforts to recruit from existing feminists, and instead work to win over that narrow slice of the population who get to be considered regular people. Some combination of white, non-immigrant, well-off, cisgender, heterosexual, and members of a nuclear family. The upper middle class, the petty bourgeoisie, whatever you want to call them. This class has a lot of influence on which political positions are considered moderate, which is part of why gender criticals are drawn to them. It's a really good look to have concerned mothers be the face of your movement instead of radical lesbians. It sort of makes it look like nothing extreme is going on. But these people do lean conservative, and they're actually a perennial target for right-wing radicalization. A century ago, they formed important bases for fascist parties in Italy and Germany. More recently, they stormed the US Capitol. In the US, people often describe this group as white evangelicals, and religion is definitely part of the story here. But you see the same political bloc emerge all over the world, across ethnicities and religions. I don't think we should underestimate how important class is. For those of you following along with the official Lily Alexander bingo card, now's the time to pull it out. So you can blot out your free space and also clearly alluding to Marxism, but won't come out and say it. Hmm. 
we're off to a good start. This group is prone to radicalization, partly because they're very privileged in the grand scheme of things, but unlike truly rich people, they're exposed to real risk. I mean, truly rich people, the ruling class, are going to be fine no matter what party's in power. But small business owners and suburban families actually feel the impact of crises and social change. Their position is comfortable, but it's precarious. So they're especially vulnerable to people raising panic that the queers want to turn their kids against them, or just telling the truth could cost them everything. These anxieties are worth acknowledging because they partly explain the appeal of far-right politics. But ultimately, progress is gonna happen, and anyone cool is happy to get with the program. If any of this is interesting to you, by the way, I recommend this great primer on fascism and class that was put out by the Chicago DSA. You can see why gender criticals would want to target this class, and for that matter, why conservatives often do. The anti-trans movement mines the resentment that comes from feeling like the social consensus is getting away from you. It exploits a fear that minorities are gaining power and building a world that doesn't revolve around your lifestyle. The gender critical movement and mainstream conservatism cater to people who, like one Abraham Simpson, used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. The ideal GC prospect is progressive on gender from the viewpoint of like the 1950s, maybe, but they're not interested in taking the movement into the 21st century. When the movement really started selling itself to the public, a common refrain was, of course I support equality, but these transgender radicals have just gone too far. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. When people talk about reactionaries, this is the reaction they're talking about. A lot of people use that word to describe any strong reaction to anything, and it really pisses me off, honestly. Like, the problem isn't that reactionaries are having reactions. The problem is that they're reacting poorly to social progress. I wish some of you would just read. Oh, you know what? Read theory. And, uh, and that's bingo. Already, Jesus. This base being made up of people who are fairly comfortable, this reaction aims to turn them from passive acceptors of the status quo into staunch defenders of the status quo. If you think the world is more or less all right for women, if the feminist project has been completed, one can argue that any structure that currently exists is good for women. I realize that's a little abstract. What I mean is that people in the anti trans movement are at the point where they're defending, like, modesty and the nuclear family and rigid gender roles as necessary for protecting women, even though all of these things exist to subjugate women. I can't help but feel like I am the one who's actually critical of gender, and modern gender criticals are pretty crazy about it. Anyway, when the right makes transphobic appeals to the public, they don't leave their other opinions at the door. They've learned quite effectively how to smuggle in conservative ideas about everything, not just gender. For instance, the fear that children are being endangered by trans healthcare is channeled into parental rights. This idea that children are their parents' property and should have less privacy and say in their own lives. Or here's what I'm hearing a lot. Gender criticals love describing trans people as lifelong medical patients who drain so many public resources that we're just not worth the trouble. That trans healthcare is just far too expensive and that money could be going to normal people who deserve it more. The idea embedded in here is that people who use too many government resources are evil, which is as right-wing as you can get. Here's the prominent gender-critical feminist Helen Joyce. While we're trying to get through to the decision makers, we have to try to limit the harm. And that means reducing or keeping down the number of people who transition. Every one of those people is basically you know, a huge problem to a sane world. Like if you've got people that, and whether they're transitioned, whether they're happily transitioned, whether they're unhappily transitioned, whether they're detransitioned, if you've got people who've dissociated from their sex in some way, every one of those people is someone who needs special accommodation in a sane world where we re-acknowledge the, the truth of sex. And I mean, the people who've been damaged by it, the children who've been put through this, those people deserve every accommodation we can possibly make. But every one of them is a difficulty. And every one of those people for 50, 60, 70 years is going to need things that the rest of us just don't need because the rest of us are just our sex. These policies being pursued under the banner of feminism really muddies the waters. 
Many people now identify as radical feminists because they agree with these arguments and associate them with radical feminism, even though ideologically they're just regular conservatives with a kind of obscure pet project. If we're asking why radical feminists would ally with the least feminist forces on earth, there's one answer. Many of them are bigots who started identifying as feminists, not the other way around. Conservatives care about trans people, at least in part, because transphobia is an investment in the future of their parties. They figured out how to use it to push people further to the right by opening them up to rolling back healthcare coverage, reducing the rights of children, enforcing traditional gender roles, and so on. The social conservatives in my country are getting in on the trans moral panic right now because their whole thing runs on outrage. I started writing this video because I was curious why the Canadian right has adopted a transphobic agenda pretty much out of nowhere and the simplest answer is, yeah, that had to be someone's turn. Within the gender critical movement, pro-woman sentiment and conservatism are not in conflict with each other at all. They're one and the same. Moderates and conservatives often affirm their support for women, specifically by way of opposition to a supposedly sexist minority group. Scorn for minorities under the guise of protecting women is how many right-wing lobbies build support. Here in Quebec, our version of gender equality is defined by religious discrimination. Women who wear hijab are banned from starting certain jobs, like they can't be teachers because our government has decided hijabs are oppressive. The exclusion is the feminism, even when those being excluded are women. Bill 21 sends the message that hijabs, um, headscarves, and turbans are not acceptable in society, and Muslims and people who are religious are also not acceptable in society. At their most extreme, xenophobic appeals like these will argue that a persecuted minority doesn't actually want to be included at all. They're only pretending they want to be included, when really what they want is free reign to brutalize innocent women. We can see this happening right now with the war on Palestine. I keep hearing this incredibly racist claim that Palestinians don't want freedom, they want revenge. This narrative has been propped up by some heavily scrutinized reporting at the New York Times. The amount of things that went wrong while putting this story together, its you gotta see it for yourself. In American history, the strategy is most often targeted black men. Racist communities, media, and politicians play to this image of black men as inherently and incurably violent, especially sexually violent towards white women, as a pretext to inciting hate crimes, gutting social programs, and spending more on prisons and policing. In the United States and other capitalist countries, rape laws as a rule were framed originally for the protection of men of the upper classes whose daughters and wives might be assaulted. What happens to working class women has usually been of little concern to the courts. As a result, remarkably few white men have been prosecuted for the sexual violence they have inflicted on these women. While the rapists have seldom been brought to justice, the rape charge has been indiscriminately aimed at black men, the guilty and innocent alike. Thus, of the 455 men executed between 1930 and 1967 on the basis of rape convictions, 405 of them were black. In the history of the United States, the fraudulent rape charge stands out as one of the most formidable artifices invented by racism. The myth of the black rapist has been methodically conjured up whenever recurrent waves of violence and terror against the black community have required convincing justification. From 2013 to 2020, the neo-Nazi website, The Daily Stormer, maintained a section of their site that almost exclusively featured stories about ethnic minorities committing crimes, especially against white women. The section, titled Race War, updated on average four times a day over those years, coming out to about 10,000 articles, most of which were about black men. That's just the most extreme example. Outlets far more mainstream fearmonger about minorities every single day, just a little less explicitly. If a seed of prejudice already exists in your readers, you don't need to come out and say a person committed a crime because they're black. Readers will make that connection themselves and use their disgust to justify their position at the top of the racial hierarchy. They conceive of themselves as pro-woman, even as feminist, 
by way of wanting nothing to do with certain people. The anti-trans movement has adopted a similar strategy, fabricating an epidemic of trans criminality and sexual aggression. They call a lot of focus to trans people doing unequivocally bad things, especially to women and children. A key name to know here is Redux, a self-described radical feminist blog that follows the Daily Stormer handbook to the letter. They're so devoted to their daily stories about trans criminals that they haven't published anything else in almost a year. Blogs like these, and more mainstream outlets like the National Post, foreground stories like that of Jessica Simpson, aka Jessica Yaniv, the woman who sued waxing places who didn't want to wax her, and tried to organize a clothing optional all ages swim day with no parents allowed (sighs) indefensible and like go to hell honestly but at the same time it's very clear what the media frenzy was trying to accomplish a more recent example would be that ontario teacher who wore a huge breastplate to school and was accused of being some sort of dangerous fetishist I've actually heard it said this person is a known right-wing troll a cis guy who's trying to start controversy And honestly, that's my suspicion too. I don't have solid proof of that, but I will say when this theory came out, a bunch of right-wingers responded by being like, oh my God, that's so awesome. He's really like sticking it to the trans people. It's like, I thought, I thought you people cared about children. I mean, no, I didn't actually think that. But the press is equally happy to spin something out of nothing. They're eager to speculate that every new mass shooting is committed by a trans person. They're also quick to hulk out at totally mundane things like trans women winning at sports or snapping back at harassment. I wanted to add a couple things I've learned about these sex pest allegation articles. Um, One, they very conspicuously seem to feature people who are like community leaders or argue with transphobes on Twitter often. (laughs) I'm sure that's a coincidence. By my count, they've done this to at least three people in my like local offline community. And uh, who knows, I could be next. So I should probably let you know that number two, lots of them are just straight up untrue. Like, like see your ass in court level, pulled from thin air, pure fiction. This probably should not have surprised me. Um, And one can only assume it's also true of the Daily Stormers coverage. Like with racist crime coverage, the strategy assumes a latent prejudice already exists in the public. The ideal gender-critical prospect already infers bad intentions when trans people do regular things, and assumes that when we do bad things, it's because we're trans. Coverage like this works to turn that implicit bias into explicit hatred. As the reader's association between trans people and violence grows, gender conformity becomes synonymous with safety and must therefore be enforced by every institution. This doesn't just open the public up to systemically discriminating against trans people, it also increases their support for targeted harassment, denial of public services, and expansion of policing as acceptable solutions for other problems. None of this is to say that the scale of transphobia is anything like the scale of anti-black racism. It's not remotely. I make this comparison cautiously because I know there's a precedent of like white trans people comparing transphobia to racism and being way off base. But in this case, I'm not the one drawing a connection. Male violence is of unique interest when arguing the risks involved in allowing men into spaces where women are vulnerable. And one of the first steps in accepting the reality of male violence is actually viewing the statistics regarding male-on-female violence. Viewing the publicly available data with a critical eye reveals a truth known to anyone on the distant right. It doesn't take any thinking woman long to see exactly which men are committing violent crime and the majority of partner violence and race realism is a natural next step. That quote is from an article called The Turf to Dissident Right Pipeline, which was written for a blog run by, Jesus Christ, literally Richard Spencer. The author, credited as Kat S., claims neo-Nazis share a common interest with anti-trans feminists and encourages both camps to reach across the aisle. I guess camps don't have aisles. Well, it's too late to fix that. It appeals to any TERFs reading by gesturing to many problems facing women today. Sexual violence, the rising cost of living, surveillance, the underwhelming results of third wave feminism. These are obviously real problems. Fascist movements are often willing to pinpoint what's making people angry and blame someone for that anger in a way that can feel refreshing if you're used to the obfuscation of the ruling class. 
Obviously, fascists wouldn't make any of these things better if they came to power. They're just opportunists. They see people angry at something and they want to direct that anger into their movement. Appeals from the far right, like in this article, aim to capture feminists who already blame trans people for the worsening conditions of women. And they want to use that blame to discredit the liberal narrative of progress, that one by one, minority groups lead movements to gain equal standing in society. And this is good. And look, I have my problems with this narrative too. The world is not going to automatically, incrementally achieve perfect harmony. That's capitalism fanfic. But the basic idea of the thing, you know, that minority rights are good, yeah, I'm cool with that. <laughs> Casting doubt on trans rights, which for a time was considered the natural next step towards social equality, calls every other civil rights movement into question and warms people up to the idea of also blaming Muslims, Jews, black people, and immigrants, you know, if they didn't already. It's solidarity in reverse. The aim is to create as many enemies as possible. Discussion of trans people as a threat to public safety seemed to strike a chord, especially at a time when public opinion on trans people was steadily improving, and many governments seemed amenable to expanding legal protections for us. I mean, the 2010s weren't great for trans rights everywhere, but broadly, it seemed like the direction the world was headed. It certainly felt that way to me as a Canadian. I'm proud to announce that tomorrow, on the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, we will be tabling a bill in the House of Commons to ensure the full protection of transgender people. And I am proud to also announce that I will attend Montreal Pride this summer, which is just a regular part of my summer schedule, but a very first for a Prime Minister. All the while, life has gotten worse in ways that governments, liberal or conservative, have failed to properly address. Probably especially since COVID, the idea that trans people should be protected has grown deeply suspicious to some segment of the population. Like, why should our lives get better if theirs are getting worse? As so many fires rage around us, resentment was probably inevitable. When a minority makes progress in times of uncertainty or crisis, reactionaries will always find a way to blame the latter on the former. We're seeing this in Canada, not just with trans people, but also with immigrants. Lots of people are moving here right now, and it's getting blamed for every bad thing that happens in this godforsaken country. Housing crisis, drug toxicity, health system collapse, homelessness. It's all getting worse while people are moving here, and I don't know, man. When two things happen at the same time, I get really scared. Turfs conspired with the right to invent a trans crisis of invasion, predation, and regret, and then blamed socially liberal parties for not using every institution at their disposal to crack down on us. It makes liberals look like weak rulers, unwilling to do what's needed because of, uh, you know, wokeness or whatever. Matt Walsh, a man whose beard kind of looks glued on, by the way, went so far as, <laughs> went so far as to blame American acceptance of queer people for, get ready for it, Russia invading Ukraine. And it's not a coincidence that this has happened after Biden spent his first year in office focusing primarily on wokeness and intentionally making our military weaker and more feminine. We advertised weakness. We bragged about it. We announced to the world repeatedly that we are now a theocratic state, but our religion is wokeness. Did, did we think that Putin wouldn't notice that? For as goofy as this angle sounds, it's worked at least a little bit. Messaging that equates transphobia with law and order has been successful enough that even theoretically progressive parties like the UK's Labour have veered right on trans issues to not appear overly bleeding heart. There's no way to neatly distinguish the transphobia of feminists from the transphobia of mainstream conservatives from the transphobia of the extreme right. These factions act as a unit, creating prejudice and then intensifying that prejudice to elevate themselves and one another. Maybe this is excessively doomer of me, but I'm not convinced there is a moderate stopping point for the wave of legislation we're seeing right now. I think the moral panic they've built is a radicalization machine that moderates won't be able to shut off even if they want to. Right now, every one of them has united behind the line that the political establishment is unfairly siding with minorities. Asking why they're doing that can lead a person pretty intuitively to the belief that minorities are the political establishment. Likewise, the media is being too nice to minorities can easily become the media is secretly run by minorities. 
And you probably know where that leads. Living in an anti-trans bubble, understanding transness as a social plague, hearing about every sin or indiscretion committed by a trans person. I have to imagine you start feeling like you're living in a different reality from everyone else. When you hear that a celebrity came out as trans or one of your kid's friends started hormones, you must ask yourself why nobody is intervening. The answer is because it's fine. But of course you can't accept that. All you hear about are the times when things go wrong. You're gonna search for other answers as to why trans people exist, why governments tolerate us, why the mainstream media isn't covering all these horror stories you're hearing about. As you radicalize further, the gap between your reality and everyone else's grows. And as that gap grows, so must the size of the cover-up. Who's benefiting from all this? Who's greenlighting all these TV shows? Why is the government paying to mutilate children? Why are there pronouns on my goddamn chocolate bar? The world of anti-trans conspiracy theories is vast and probably well known to most of you. You hear people bring them up in bits and pieces in a way that can make it sound like they're not conspiracy theories, but widely known facts. You know, people call us groomers, they gesture at the elites who are supposedly financing the movement. It's like, girl, I wish. These theories are so normalized that it's easy not to realize just how deep the iceberg goes. Thanks, by the way, to Krista Peterson and the YouTuber Sean for collecting receipts for all this. I'll link their work below. Anyway, all roads lead to Billick. Technology is taking us as a species on a bullet train ride towards humanities melding with AI. The pharma and tech-controlled media are overriding any critique of the purported human rights movement, a movement poised to rake in enormous future profits for pharma and tech. They are engaged in overt censorship regarding any critique of what this agenda is doing to society, children, and women's rights. When we step back to look at the bigger picture, something much different than a human rights movement emerges. It also explains why most major corporations, banks, pharmaceutical, tech, and medical industries, along with politicians and governments, are all in for trans. Why would they care about 0.03% of the population? What is the investment? Jennifer Billick is a gender-critical conspiracy theorist who believes global elites are advancing trans rights in order to bring about transhumanism, the melding of man with machine, the obsolescence of biological life, maybe even the human instrumentality project. Okay, well, now I'm just pandering. On her blog, The Eleventh Hour, Billick theorizes about the Jewish transgender elites she says are funding the trans rights movement, especially heiress Jennifer Pritzker and businesswoman Martine Rothblatt. And on social media, she remarks that it's really interesting that both are Jewish. She directs her followers to learn more about this by checking out the work of a straightforward neo-Nazi. On the surface, Billick seems considerably further out than the rest of the people I've talked about today. Her articles are so poorly written and make such incoherent connections that I'm convinced the only thing her work has to offer is a pathway into conspiracy. I mean, at least J.K. Rowling is a good writer. Oh, no. Um... At least Helen Joyce is a good writer. At least, get back to me. What people don't see is what Martine Rothblatt and the other elite corporatists colonizing human sex for profit do see. The advancements in technology and a totalitarian market that are rapidly moving us towards this melding. Most people do not see the technological advancements for governing the reproductive capacities of women or the colonization process underway toward that end. Scientists have created a frog robot from living skin and heart stem cells of the African clawed frog, Xenopus lavis, a robot that mimics in many ways the frog it was molded from. The machines are tiny creatures, less than a millimeter, 0.04 inches wide, and they can walk and swim, survive for weeks without food. Sheila Jeffries is a good... At least Kara Dansky is a good writer. At least... We're gonna move on. But yeah... It's honestly QAnon-level shit. It's word association. For example, here's some of her evidence for why Jewish transhumanists are behind this whole conspiracy. One time, the Pentagon explored the idea of creating exoskeletons for soldiers, and the Pentagon contracts Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab to do military research. And Martine Rothblatt once gave a talk at Johns Hopkins University, and Martine Rothblatt has written books about cybernetics. 
Not convinced? Well, what if I told you another trans woman named Lynn Conway worked at the Pentagon in the 80s, and she also worked at the University of Michigan, which later opened a mental health research department funded by the Pritzker family, which includes Jewish transgender billionaire Jennifer Pritzker. What if I told you that, huh? Missile, missile, Fox 3, splash, as the world turns, red October. <laughs> you gotta keep in mind, these people don't think trans people exist, right? So every single one is a point of suspicion. It's a, it's a little, what do you call those little thingies on your, it's one of those on your, oh my God, <laughs> I didn't script this part. You might think from how bonkers this is that it's fringe, but it's not. Jennifer Billick is beloved by the anti-trans mainstream. She is cited or praised by nearly every anti-trans group you've heard of. Billick was interviewed for a best-selling book by Helen Joyce, which used her work so uncritically that the book contained a straight-up lie that Billick originated. Jennifer Billick may not personally be famous, but her writing gets shout-outs on Fox fucking news. There is a tremendous amount of money behind this movement, and if your viewers are interested in learning more about that, because I know we don't have time tonight, please visit the 11th Hour blog. It's literally the number 11, 1, 1, 11th Hour blog. It goes into extraordinary depths to explain where the money is coming from and why this movement is so well-funded. Now, there is the standard populist thing at play here. When people repeat Billick's claims in front of a wide audience, they talk about elites, they talk about the woke mob, but rarely do they come out and say, I think it's the Jews. Who specifically they blame is modular enough that versions of this theory can circulate in Tablet Magazine, a right-wing Jewish publication, or be regurgitated by Barry Weiss, who is herself Jewish. In the past, societal taboos were generally reached through a cultural consensus. Today's taboos, on the other hand, are often fringe ideas pushed by a zealous cabal trying to redefine what is acceptable and what should be shunned. It is a group that has control of nearly all of the institutions that produce American cultural and intellectual life. Media, to be sure, but also higher education, museums, publishing houses, marketing and advertising outfits, Hollywood, K-12 education, technology companies, and increasingly, corporate human resource departments. Sorry, a zealous cabal that has control over nearly every American institution? Barry, do you hear what you're saying? You know what you do? You, you buy yourself a tape recorder, you just record yourself for a whole day. I think you're going to be surprised at some of your phrasing. Now, I want to underline that not every single gender critical is a conspiracy theorist who's bought into blood and soil white nationalism. Probably not even most of them. Some of them are immigrants, some are ethnic or religious minorities. Some, against all odds, remain liberals on every issue but this one. To imply all gender criticals are personally far right would be... Oh, I finally have a chance to do this. Okay, okay. Deeply unserious. There's kind of a spectrum of beliefs about the origins of the trans rights movement, which can have members blaming an enemy as vague as the woke mob or as specific as one guy. The crucial thing is the enemy is secretive and exerts undue power over the political establishment. So let's like plot out that spectrum a little. On the most moderate end, you can think being trans is real, but a mental illness. The trans people are trying to force the world to change instead of bettering ourselves. A little further out, you can think that the media is behind it. They make money off the attention we get, so they're promoting us widely. A little further out, you can believe trans rights are funded by the medical establishment to make money off of surgeries. Further out, you can think that trans people are the result of pollution messing with kids' hormones or DNA. Even further than that, you can think trans people are a sex cult, demanding rights only as a means to groom more children. And all the way out at the absolute extreme, you can believe all of the previous ones and that the Jewish elites are transing white children to sterilize them and put an end to the Aryan race. And judging by the praise for Jennifer Billick, a really concerning amount of the movement's leaders are approaching this end. These beliefs range from cruel and misguided to ragingly, openly genocidal. And no matter which one a person agrees with, there will be people eager to usher them over to the next. Not all of them are even conspiracy theories, strictly speaking, but all of them lead to the same place. Trans people constitute a crisis, the elites aren't taking it seriously, 
Desperate times call for desperate measures. Gender critical paranoia insists that trans radicalism is lurking behind every corner, ready to pounce on anyone who's willing to tell the truth. Men, women, or children, feminists, moderates, or fascists. Such a crisis, they argue, requires them to consolidate anti-trans power by forming a very broad coalition. I watched this great video called JK Rowling's New Friends by the YouTuber Sean. The video explores the political alignment of several of the UK's leading anti-trans activists, specifically the ones in this picture, and he offers a truckload of examples of this coalition being built and maintained. One that really lays it all out is this Twitter thread from LGB Alliance co-founder Alison Bailey. To be clear, every woman and girl must know that their sex-based rights will disappear if they do not pay attention and join this struggle. This is so, regardless of their skin color, age, economic status, politics, education, etc. Whether they are non-racist, racist, homosexual or homophobic, that doesn't mean I condone racist or homophobic behavior, I abhor it. This is a danger and a struggle the likes of which none of us has ever known. Adhering to any given political or philosophical belief system is not the immediate priority. If I'm being attacked and someone is willing to come to my rescue, I'm not going to ask about their politics before welcoming their help. If, after the danger has passed, I see that they have rescued me only to hurt me, I will have survived long enough to beat them back. Rome is burning. Gatekeeping those who can help put out the flames is just folly. End. This video is an essential resource. It was a big help on this project, and uh, I think you should check it out when you're done here. For now, I'm just going to blaze through some of the examples he names so you can understand the scale of collaboration going on here. Posey Parker welcomes far-right British nationalists at her anti-trans rallies. She's praised Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's a member of Hands Across the Isle, a group run by anti-gay and anti-abortion Christians trying to reach out to feminists. Maya Forstadter gave a talk for the Christian extremists at the aforementioned Alliance Defending Freedom. J.K. Rowling has spoken out in support of arranged marriages defender Matt Walsh. She wears Posey Parker's merch and has offered to pay her legal fees. She's spoken out in support of at least two people who talk unflinchingly about wanting to torture and murder trans activists. She also has a decades-long association with a Tory politician who is an active and committed homophobe in the House of Lords. Bonus round, not in the video, but it bears mentioning Megan Murphy, who's probably Canada's most prominent gender-critical feminist, has that tweet about imprisoning parents who take their kids to drag shows. Um, she was also aligned with the right-wing, somewhat anti-vax trucker convoy that took over Ottawa in 2022. And shocker, she is also a fan of Jennifer, Jewish elites are transing your children, Billick. The trans-exclusionary feminists' coalition with the far right has not been uncontroversial. Many feminists spoke out against it as it was forming. But since the merge is basically complete in the UK, almost everyone who hasn't left over it has fallen in line. Julie Bindle has been a radical feminist since the 1970s, and until recently that was reflected in her politics, which were much more aligned with Janice Raymond than the conservative party of insert country here. In 2019, she strongly condemned Wolf and Posey Parker for their choice to work with the Christian right. But by 2023, Posey Parker's star had risen substantially, and I guess Bindle decided to get with the program. So when Parker came under fire for allowing this to happen at one of her rallies... Hey, you worried about us! Fuck you, Fuck you! Bindle had nothing negative to say. In fact, she wrote an article defending Parker, condemning the backlash, describing trans counter-protesters as a threat to democracy, and not once mentioning the Nazis. Their right to be there, I guess, is so beyond reproach, so obvious it doesn't even require acknowledging. We know at least some gender criticals have at least some kind of moral compass that would normally lead them to believe things like, Nazis are bad, and I don't want to be around Nazis. And yet, despite any reservations they may hold, despite any concerns they've voiced previously, they are in the same movement. How do they reconcile that? First, they convince themselves that marching alongside people they hate doesn't mean they have much of anything in common with them. These days, the gender-critical movement doesn't really brand itself as feminist or traditionalist or any other ideology. 
but rather as non-ideological and actually anti-ideology. It's right there in the name, right? Feminist says what you believe in. Gender critical only says that you don't believe, that you're free of a pervasive gender ideology being shoved down our throats. This is why some transphobes were calling themselves gender atheists a few years back, which I honestly wish they would bring back because it's it's so transparently uncool. So yeah, they almost posture as like a free speech collective in favor of saying whatever society judges to be unacceptable, so long as it's also transphobic. This justifies partnerships across pretty contradictory tendencies. Back in the fall, there was this big anti-trans march in downtown Montreal, and I was at the counter protest. I saw people carrying Trump 2024 signs, yes, in Canada, protesting alongside Muslim families, with all of them chanting the same slogans. But as I hope we have all learned by now, letting anyone say anything does not lead to a balanced, nonpartisan movement. It can actually end up elevating people with the most extreme views, and in the case of gender criticals, pushing the movement further and further to the right. People like Posey Parker or Matt Walsh, real fringe scumbags, get a lot of press specifically for being controversial, which leads them to the lucrative cancel culture podcast circuit. Keen and Walsh and their allies can pretend they became controversial for simply standing up for common sense, as if they didn't earn their bad reputations by being blatant far-right extremists. Well, well that obviously makes you a Nazi, because that is definitely akin to uh, the mass genocide of uh, six million Jews and other minority groups in Germany in the 90, late 1930s, 40s. That's exactly the same. Standing up for women's rights is exactly sa the same as being a Nazi. Now, second of all, in connecting to this, the path from mainstream transphobia into far right ideology is well established, but somewhat obscured. Fairly few people in the movement are writing about race science for Jesus Christ, literally Richard Spencer. And fascism that's any amount less obvious than that is liable to go over people's heads. Far-right extremism is influential but somewhat off the beaten path, and those who do adhere to it are rarely forthcoming with their true beliefs. That's true about just about every genre of anti-trans activists, really. They straight up won't tell you what they believe. They'll tweak their messaging to suit their audience and the political climate to such an extent that they totally contradict themselves all the time. That's why you need to play this weird game of ideological hopscotch to understand where certain claims are coming from. One day, Alison Bailey deplores bigotry. The next, she's sharing Jennifer Billick's articles. One second, Posey Parker is worried biological males pose a danger in women's spaces. The next, she's urging men to self-deputize and enter women's bathrooms with guns. Someone like Helen Joyce speaks in the Register of Women's Rights. A run-of-the-mill liberal can follow her for years, probably, without ever realizing her work is built on the conspiracy theory that Jewish lizard bankers are transing children to create a new world order. As a follower of Joyce or Bailey or whoever, you can be oblivious to their conspiracism or disavow it outright, but even if you do, conspiracy theories will continue to motivate your political actions because a conspiracy theorist will still be the one handing down orders. Also... Two days before I had to film this, Helen Joyce was caught reading sexually explicit Harry Potter fan fiction about children in public. And I didn't, I didn't have time to work that into the script in any way, but I just needed you to know that the A-list turf Helen Joyce was caught reading smut about children. She says it was for research. Uh, <laughs> she says it was for research. To be charitable for a second... Working with people you disagree with can be a pragmatic way to get things done. Coalitions are not inherently evil. I work with liberals and anarchists all the time, even though I am neither pro-capitalist nor anti-bedtime. Cheap shot, sorry. Yeah, by all means, work with people, but also use your brain, right? It's incredibly naive to think the far right would show up at your events with anything but nefarious intentions, or to think they care about women in the same way you do. Nor do they care about the struggles of blue-collar teenagers, nor do they care about the planet. When fascists infiltrated environmentalism, it didn't reduce carbon emissions. When they infiltrated punk, it led to more violence, more stigma, and worse music. Collaborating with them never helps the original cause, because fascists don't show up to help. I hope it goes without saying that the redirection of anger about misogyny into transphobia has been a disaster for feminism. And I include trans-exclusionary feminism in that. Sure, a few movement leaders have boosted their public profile, 
but mostly it's just forced the movement to abandon any commitment to reproductive rights, separatism, gender abolition, things they once held as core principles. These days when they talk about abortion, it's to complain that we're saying pregnant people and not pregnant women. With the new legislations around abortion taking place in Texas, many human rights organizations decided to use the wording people who can get pregnant rather than simply women to describe the ones being affected by the new law. Would you consider this a step towards inclusivity or an act of erasure of women? It's not inclusive if you're excluding half of the planet. Men do not need ever to access abortion. Ever. The liberals who fall in line, like Keir Starmer's Labour Party, have abandoned their principles too. On the other hand, the far right hasn't compromised on anything to join this coalition, nor were they asked to, nor would they have complied if they had been asked to. Extremists are drawn to the anti-trans movement, not because of any support for what trans-exclusionary feminism was before they infiltrated, but because it's an infiltrator's daydream, one of the best targets imaginable. Because unlike environmentalism or punk, the anti-trans movement is essentially a normalization machine. It takes these fairly fringe beliefs and uplifts concerned parents and well-off white ladies as spokespeople in order to convince the public that everyone normal already holds them. The leadership is willing to accept anything as pro-woman and defend the honor of any person who sides with them in a given moment. That is a very powerful tool to put in the hands of fascists. It kind of blows my mind that someone with even the most backwards feminist ideology would be willing to share a space with these people. Don't they understand that this is what fascists do? They co-opt a movement, then they purge everyone but themselves. Co-opt, then purge. Co-opt, then pull out the long knives. The idea that feminists could simply outmaneuver them is so naive and has so clearly proven itself false by now that I can't help but wonder, was this the plan all along? Did Lear, Keith, or Alison Bailey know that this coalition would be a disaster for feminism and like that about it? Has every person fighting against trans rights, from lesbian feminist to suburban parent to conservative politician, secretly been an exterminationist fascist from the jump? Ah, eh, I mean, some of them, yeah. Like, Kelly J. Keene, obviously a far-right infiltrator. The people behind Redux and Feminist Current, wolves in sheep's clothing, fuck them. But let's not chalk the whole movement up to some unseen evil. Scores of gender criticals describe themselves as moderates or liberals or radical leftists, and I think most of them are being honest about that. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what these people believe at all. Trying to figure out what's in their heads is an utter waste of time and misunderstands what fascism even is. Fascism is driven by an ideology, sure, but ideas don't leap off the page and kill people. Its dangerous component is its process. The process by which a movement exploits crises to seize unchecked power, expand surveillance, punish dissidents, strip their opponents of legal protections, force them out of employment, and deputize civilians to commit atrocious violence. This process does not require rabid support from every collaborator. In fact, it's crucial to convince moderate or apolitical actors to simply go along with things. You know, I didn't know this until a few weeks ago, but when Mussolini first came to power after staging a paramilitary siege of Rome, he governed on a center-right platform. Tax cuts, privatizations, corporate bailouts. Not all of his supporters were invested in his exact brand of nationalist bullshit. Many had just been business owners who wanted to protect their own class interests from the communists and anarchists who were threatening to take all that away. Mussolini was good for business, so these regular people formed an important part of his base, and their support lent his party legitimacy. Whatever they thought they'd stood for quickly became trivial. The political machine of transphobia is not rooted in a shared worldview. In fact, it was born out of a call to abandon ideology in favor of a crackdown process. Members are expected to cast aside all attachments to other principles, gender equality, civil rights, because the process of trans elimination is simply more pressing. As Alison Bailey said in 2020, Rome is burning. Gatekeeping those who can help put out the flames is just folly. As a result, though, they can't agree what they're fighting for. 
The movement has no win condition. There's no final state of the world that'll leave them all satisfied. Faith in the anti-trans process is all they have in common. Its unifying power means the process must intensify forever or else fall apart entirely. In countries where the movement has progressed fairly far, it's apparently more controversial to be a moderate transphobe than an extreme one. The British anti-trans org Genspect recently came under fire for hiring a woman named Helen Pluckrose because she said that people should be allowed to transition if they want to. She has gotten so much shit from her own people for saying this and not backing down. Pluckrose talks a lot about the free exchange of ideas and liberal principles. She's one of very few active gender criticals who I would honestly describe as principled. And yet, she too has subordinated her beliefs to the process. She chose to accept a role at Genspect, a group whose members want to ban HRD for anyone under 25, a policy which, medically speaking, might kill me. <laughs> Whether a member of the movement could be individually labeled fascist in a vacuum comes down to whether they realize what they're doing. A lot of people are just along for the ride here. You don't have to see the code in the matrix to write a shitty article. But at the end of the day, if you're writing the article, you're writing the article. Call yourself whatever you want, but don't expect me to ignore reality. People like Pluckrose are only useful so long as their reputation laundering effect is needed. The United Kingdom is provably past that point now. I think the United States is certainly past that point too. Canada isn't yet. Our gender critical movement still needs its concern trolls, its rural voters, its regular people. Everything about their strategy is designed for these people to affirm their normalcy, their power over the powerless, their right to personal comfort by any means necessary. They're in their think of the children phase, foregrounding issues like the threat to girls' sports and sexual indoctrination in schools. So when the trans community shows up and shouts fascist at a bunch of families with young children, it certainly doesn't look good. That's another conversation. But we only do it because we know what's happening. We've watched this exact process play out so many times across the world. It's very easy to tell where they're going with this. And if I have to watch one more regular person take the bait, I'm going to lose my fucking mind. With such a wide range of people giving us a hard time lately... It can sometimes feel like the whole planet is conspiring against us. Nearly all the trans people I know are barely scraping by, struggling in ways they've done nothing to deserve, while the people working to intensify our suffering face no such stigma. A lot of people I know are withdrawing. A lot of them are coping in ways that worry me. But I would warn against turning this fear into a political doctrine of like, danger is everywhere, every stranger is a potential threat. Catastrophizing like that can lead us to be really twitchy and make it hard to know where to focus our energy. That and it's just not accurate. Most people don't care about this stuff, and even most transphobes aren't evil in the way we usually imagine evil. They're not evil in the way that they think we are. While there's no shortage of extremists and exterminationists, most people in the anti-trans movement are basically regular people. And that can't absolve them. Their beliefs are well within the status quo and also would kill or forcibly detransition a lot of the people in my life. In this liberal democracy where I live, it's entirely mainstream to deprive people of health care. It's entirely mainstream to force minorities out of public life. It's mainstream to leave people to die if they're costing the government too much money. And the fact that these goals can be achieved within the current political machine should condemn that machine as absolutely beyond saving. Fascism exploits a moral rot, but the rot's already there. But the second one is every one of those people is basically, you know, a huge problem to a sane world. Like if you've got people, that, whether they're transitioned, whether they're happily transitioned, whether they're unhappily transitioned, whether they're detransitioned, if you've got people who've dissociated from their sex in some way, every one of those people is someone who needs special accommodation in a sane world where we re-acknowledge the, the truth of sex. And I mean, the people who've been damaged by it, the children who've been put through this, those people deserve every accommodation we can possibly make. But every one of them is a difficulty. Every one of those people for 50, 60, 70 years is going to need things that the rest of us just don't need because the rest of us are just our sex. So the, the fewer of those people there are, the better.
This person, who suffers a hereditary disease, has a lifelong cost of 60,000 Reichsmarks to the national community. Fellow German, that is your money as well. In times like these, it's comforting to remind myself that the anti-trans movement will never succeed. Fascism, by its own construction, has no win state. They can deal enormous amounts of damage, and they already are. But short of extinguishing the entire human race, there's actually no way to get rid of us. They can't stop the next generation from being born and finding each other. There will always be trans people. Always. And I don't say this to pacify myself or you, but to remind myself what we're working toward here. We can't afford to fall into the same habits as trans-exclusionary feminists and betray all our principles over petty bullshit. There's a long future ahead of the trans community, no matter how things go this decade. And that means we need to be measured in our approach, and we need to work to understand the opposition in all its complexity. I hope I've been able to do that over the past fucking, I don't know, five hours, probably. <laughs> If you hang out in this corner of the internet, you've probably heard a lot of creators talk about Nebula by now, the streaming service we've all been building together. What you might not know is just how valuable this platform has been to smaller creators like me. I feel really uplifted there, honestly. I'm on the homepage right now. Pretty cool. <laughs> the support and feedback I've gotten from creators way more established than me. The amount of resources that Nebula offers us. It's been a game changer in more ways than I can name, and this has only been possible because of our viewers. So thanks. Over the past year, we've gotten so much enthusiastic support from the community that Nebula can afford to invest in some really ambitious creator projects to release as Nebula originals. Jesse Gender has the sci-fi movie coming out soon. It's awesome. Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube has a vampire rom-com coming out, which I expect will make at least most of you go absolutely feral. Tons of originals have released in the last few months alone. Lindsay Ellis recently put out an original that I think might be her best video ever. And I don't say that lightly. Her rent video from back in the day is the reason I'm doing this at all. The Ballad of John and Yoko is about how we talk about the women in the vicinity of male tragedy. How pop culture did so wrong by Yoko Ono, Courtney Love, and Meghan Markle in such vulnerable moments. And above all, about what actually broke up the Beatles. Because it wasn't Yoko. I love video essays, man. It's a privilege to share a platform with something like this. The depth of knowledge and insight on display is unbelievable. It gets like the strongest recommendation. None of these projects would be possible without our viewers. If you'd like to help me make a cool original project like this, the best way to do that is to sign up for Nebula with my link. You'll be able to watch all of my videos ad-free at least a day before they go up on YouTube. And you know what? I'm feeling generous. I'm going to throw in a little 40% off. So it's only 30 bucks a year. If you already have a Nebula subscription, thank you. I hope you enjoy everything we've got in store for you this year. Also, you should watch my videos on Nebula. Why are you seeing this ad? And uh, yeah, if all this sounds good to you, head over to go.nebula.tv slash Lily Alexander. So much good stuff on there. And uh, thanks to Nebula. Woo! Another one in the bag, baby. I didn't think this was going to take three months. Um, I want to thank Lola Sebastian for offering some really helpful script feedback for this video. I also want to thank Sophie Lasfolk for sending me a school project she wrote called Anti-Trans Movements, The New Alt-Right Pipeline, which she personally translated from Finnish for me. I didn't end up using it directly, but her bibliography was a big help, and I really appreciate the gesture. Thanks to all these people for lending their voices to the quotes. I don't actually know who's going to do it yet. I'm not sure I even know enough people. I'm really grateful that I have a chance to do work like this, but uh, this one in particular was a little bit taxing. So if ever you want to send me a cup of coffee a month, two cups of coffee a month, a big old sandwich with the fries every month, it'd be deeply appreciated. Thank you also to my existing patrons, some of whom have been supporting me for three years straight at this point. Some are friends or family, but most are strangers, and seeing their names pop up every month is a real treat. So, to the following people, Smaz Ruby, Jasperi Wirtanen, Darla Butler, Faye Rantic, Ruby Lando Pincus, whose name I misread for like the first year of this channel, Piper Cook, Root, Tasha Yasha, Helga Rausch, Average Sylvana Shipper, Christopher Stilson, Samari Braley, Izzy, Wimble Limble, Sam, Mary Wishart, Celeste Blossom, Hazel Shockey, Anastasia Wolf, Gwen Lofman, Hema Felis, Lydia Nevin, Michelle Kopp, 
Ivy, Cody Jacobs, Alejandro Hernandez, Kate G, Rick Akoy, Taylor Hardy, Guillaume, and the recognition scene. All of you, welcome to the official Lily Alexander Founders Club. As of now, the perks are nothing. I can make a t-shirt if you want. And of course, all my patrons help me make this show. So I also have to shout out Maven, Emily Martins, Quinn Osgood, Noah DeGrange, Ava Brooklyn, Ali K, Sizam, Jade Persuades, Maddie Doman, Quillworth, Toffee, Jonathan Gilligan, Mid-Tier Art, Rose V. Dale, Sasha Karbachinsky, Tyler Bloom, Noah, Cool Reader 18, Chloe, Chris Delassa, oh, no more water, uh, Jesse Earl, Marin, Johanna, Luna is Lovely, Georgiana Cleveland, Linda Jewers, Ed Yother, Arden Quartz, Ali QZ, Sfina Joliet, Osha, Kelly Jennings, L Infinity, Dan Bennett, Aisling, Juniper Like the Berry, Number Four, Wesley Potts, Les ZCB, Netherfield, Tin Can, Edgar Allan Pup, Catherine Ann McCloskey Ross, Benchelada, Matilda, Non Anonymous, Naomi Ben Porath, Hannah Leishnitz, oh, she's in there twice, Vivian, James Ayers, Amy, Seth Peacock, James Conkling, Joe Liss, Nick Muggio, David Bennett, Jane Malcolm, June Too Soon, Ariel K. Rose, Charlie H., George Nutt, Cattinger, Tony Vernon, Spencer Anderson McGilligott, Donnie Hayward, Sarah Melody Vinci, Lillian, Emily McLean, I swear we didn't plan this, Alia J. Scott, Guillaume, Anemone, Noah Gray, Kira Williams, Colin Coltrera, Jeff, Henri, Emma Casley, Chloe Jane, Aaron Laura, Ms. Horrible, Meta JPEG, Siobhan is too good for a free banana, Aaron, Momo, Ripley Gaindon, Gwyndon, Eugene K, June Walker, Miri Jam, Duck Rose Chilies, Megahertz, Dan Lazote, The Numeral One, Bradley Gothrop, Blueberry Hill, Kellen, Eco Room, ow! <laughs> Henry Machutin, Jordan Lawrence, Paige Landers, June Safry, EVG Express, Fox Oslander, don't touch the mic, please, Gem Violet, Ash Joubert, Melody, Aria Bend, Jess Schmida, Zephyr Violet, Kaylin Aaron, Josh Gray, Allison J. Sterling, Alicia Stella, Kale, Mills, or maybe Miles, Scott, sometimes Lucy, Emmy Murphy, Cassie, Aurora Raswell, Christine H., Marley, Alexander Morera, Euphonica, Escher, Erica Peterson, Smarco, Scott Weber, Kiki, Zoe Ritako Close, Ember, Ari, Duress Wintermute, Caroline Matheson, Bryce, ZHL, Visprin Dojos, Caroline Clark, Electric Dusk, NL May, Cole, Aura, Frogsmore, Biz Anderson, Saris, Evie Rivka, Lincoln, Sophie Kuebertz, Different Name, MJ, Eric Edmondson, Jonathan McIntosh, Hannah, Kafuyu, Stina Carey, Andrew Young, Anna Nicholson, Olivia Grimes, Ben, River, Matilde, Rachel Ann, Emily, Clara Griffin, Rain, Sorceress Gia, Harmony, Rose Juliet, Square 44, Jamie Yu, and Avery J, and also Andrea. <laughs> I don't know what reading credits brings out in me. I don't know who I become. A Greg reading of S9 YouTube commenter. Oh... The most violent mobs are the woke ones. All you have to do is say something true, like there are only two genders. And they attack in a mob. <laughs> this is such a fucked up quote. I'm, I'm, so, this is such a fucked up quote. <laughs> this is, this sucks. 